people are deeply rooted in their land. The land, the sea, and everything that surrounds them, both living and non-living, defines who they are as a people. What did we learn from the past? I mean, that's basically um, where I'm starting the conversation about climate displacement is uh, learning from our past and what did the displacement experiences in the past uh, teach us. This culture of identity associated with Waitui and Wasawasa that was once part of the Bunidongolo community will now have to switch or adapt to farming on surrounding hills, breeding introduced fish species in their ponds and grazing livestock as part of the relocation plan. We are in the early stages of a mass climate-driven migration across our region. Every year, more of our citizens will be forced to leave their homes to escape stronger storms, rising seas, and swelling rivers brought by climate change. In order to avert or minimize internal displacement, we need to continue efforts to mitigate carbon emissions and support climate change adaptation processes, especially those that integrate traditional and local knowledge. For us, we believe that the focus of the dialogue needs to be at the national and community level. The regional and international support is certainly welcome, but to successfully address the issues of internal displacement, the key national stakeholders and affected communities need to take the lead, be the lead on any solutions on this matter. I must emphasize that our first priority as governments should be to help people stay in their homes and in their communities. Nauru has serious concerns that rather than being a last resort, the relocation of people could become the preferred option for dealing with the climate crisis because it is cheaper for the biggest historical polluters. Any initiative that addresses migration needs to be counterbalanced by a strong political message that it is the responsibility of the largest historical polluters to prevent dangerous climate change so that climate-driven migration can be minimized to the greatest extent possible. Fiji consistently requires expertise or technical support to address human rights issues, social, psychological, cultural and emotional losses faced by displaced communities and those that are relocated, providing relevant expertise and also training local staff to cater for this need will benefit the ongoing efforts currently underway. We need better research and inclusive transparent dialogue to inform evidence-based policy around displacement and other forms of mobility. So we'll be working with researchers and practitioners in the region to better understand current and future patterns of climate-related human mobility in the Pacific region and the impact this will have for New Zealand and for Pacific communities. The regional dimension is an important one as it can improve Pacific readiness through a number of different approaches such as regional collaboration to identify common national challenges that can be effectively addressed by uniform approaches to be undertaken as regional programs. Addressing internal displacement needs to be anchored in development policies and processes and cannot be siloed or restricted only to emergency response. We need to shift gears from being response oriented to think of prevention and durable solutions need to ensure that internally displaced people are not rejected and they should be given basic rights and access to services. Displaced specific families should not feel like an outsider within the region. We have the opportunity to lead by example and show the rest of the world how to deal with matters relating to inter internal displacement. Bulawinaka, everyone, and, uh, and thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon for this webinar. 
I think this video is really timely and uh, it reminds us of some of the key messages across the region on, on why we are discussing uh, those issues around climate change uh, and its uh, impact uh, on countries within the region. My name is uh, Solomon Kanta. I'm the Chief of Mission for the IOM office here in Fiji. And on behalf of IOM, the Swiss Confederation, and the chairs of the Technical Working Group on Human Mobility, I would like to welcome all of you to today's uh, webinar. I will be your moderator for today, and I'll do my best to ensure that we, uh, we stay within the, the hour. We are extremely excited to have you uh, joining us uh, this afternoon uh, under the Pacific uh, Resilience Partnership to share the outcomes of the research briefs commissioned and guided by the PRP Technical Working Group on Human Mobility. As some of you know, the Technical Working Group on Human Mobility was established in 2019 from the recommendation of the first Pacific Resilience Meeting on the need for partners to address issues of climate and disaster-driven displacement, migration, and planned relocation. The overall objective of the technical working group is to strengthen regional collaboration, promote best practices, and the exchange of lessons learned in terms of human mobility linked to the effects of climate change and disasters in the Pacific. And especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time, just to give you a brief overview of the aims of the technical working group. Uh, the Technical Working Group aims to enhance coordination of related initiatives and voluntary actions related to migration, displacement, and planned relocation in the context of increasing climate change and disaster risk identified in the FRDP and the PRM. It also aims to serve as a regional expert platform for networking and representation with the capacity to support governments and partners on specific issues and promote and strengthen efforts at the regional and national levels to address climate change and disaster-driven migration, displacement, and planned relocation. In its efforts to providing evidence-based information to fill knowledge gaps, the Technical Working Group on Human Mobility commissioned and guided the development of uh, three research briefs. This responds directly to the activities in our work plan to document case studies for national and regional policy and for technical guidance to support the implementation of these policies, including through coordinated positions or approaches among the different actors and experts supporting Pacific Island countries to address this issue. And in order to arrive um, at these thematic topics uh, that we will be discussing today, the technical working group took the following approach. Firstly is to uh, a mapping exercise and workshop that was conducted amongst the technical working group um, members to understand the areas of expertise and gaps. Uh, secondly, a survey was conducted prior to the Pacific Regional Consultation on Internal Displacement, which received responses from the technical working group on human uh, mobility uh, members. Pacific government, civil society, which listed the challenges and issues in the context of uh, climate related displacement. Thirdly, the Pacific Regional Consultation on Internal Displacement brought together 11 governments that further reflected on these questions in their interventions. Uh, fourthly, the consultations led to the technical working group members to inform a national uh, practice and a regional framework. Uh, to also identify key areas of concern. And following a compilation of some of the thematic topics, the Technical Working Group on Human Mobility prioritized the main issues based on the call for proposals which was issued. So this was the, uh, the process that was taken. So we are happy now to, uh, we've identified experts to, to work on these um, research briefs. And the first brief uh, was on financing relocation and activities connected to climate-related mobility in the Pacific. Uh, the second brief um, was on the importance of land tenure and land rights 
and how they shape relocation in the context of climate change. Uh, and the third brief was on integrating the, integrating the perspectives of women and people with disabilities uh, on uh, human mobility in national policies. So we will be hearing from uh, the uh, presenters on, on these three briefs. Uh, so with this in mind, we have uh, a lineup of uh, the presentations today by the authors of these uh, research briefs to share their findings. Uh, and then following this, we will open the floor to uh, you for question and, and answer session. Uh, and we will wrap up our discussions by setting some of the upcoming regional and uh, global platforms where we can uh, summarize this, this work and also present some of the findings uh, from these briefs. Uh, before we begin, let me firstly, uh, once again, remind um, all of you on some of the, the house rules, uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, firstly, I request that, uh, that you kindly have your microphones uh, on mute if you are not speaking. Uh, of course, you know that uh, raise your hand uh, in case if you wish to um, raise a comment or a question uh, or unmute and, and take the floor. And uh, of course, please feel free to send messages uh, or questions um, via the chat box uh, as, for, as well. So we'll, uh, we'll monitor your comments and, uh, and questions and, and respond to them. Uh, before I get to our presenters, um, let me take this opportunity. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, His Excellency, Mr. Fabian Grass from the Embassy of Switzerland uh, in Canberra, Australia, who will be delivering a very brief remark uh, today. Uh, Mr. Grass is the new uh, Deputy Head of Mission of the Swiss Embassy in Canberra since January 2021. Uh, prior to this, he was the Head of Policy Planning and Diplomatic uh, Advisor to the Swiss State Secretary. On this note, uh, we would like to acknowledge uh, also and thank um, Switzerland for being the main sponsor uh, of this project. Mr. Grass, thank you for joining us uh, today. It's a pleasure to, to have you uh, join us for this uh, webinar. Uh, let me invite you now to take the floor. Over to you, Mr. Grass. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, such. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, warm regards from Canberra. Uh, here at the Swiss Embassy um, to Australia. Uh, we also cover our site accreditations, uh, five Pacific nations, PNG, Vanuatu, Kiribati, Nauru, and Solomon Islands. Um, the new ambassador has just arrived. Uh, her name is Caroline Vichet Antamatan, and he, she's uh, uh, passing also her warm regards to you. Uh, she can't be with you as she's uh, dealing with her own personal move. Uh, so exciting times. So I think yeah. We are already in the topic of, uh, um, uh, of migration as such, uh, just the climate is missing uh, for this. Uh, she, of course, wasn't uh, relocated due to climate, uh, but uh, to pursue her career here as the new Swiss ambassador and first female Swiss ambassador in addition. Uh, so the, Her Excellency, that's her. Uh, I'm the deputy. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a privilege to just say some few words. Uh, as you have said, uh, yes, we are a main sponsor of this project since November 2020. Uh, we really understand that climate change is the main challenge of our time and that it will and is affecting so many parts of our life, uh, from food to health, um, housing, access to basic infrastructure, but also, of course, on migration. And my own country, Switzerland, has been touched by climate change over proportionally, one could say. Uh, we already witnessed a two degrees increase. So actually uh, already over what we uh, have set uh, for the Paris Agreement. Um, of course, one cannot compare a Pacific island to Switzerland and the other way around. Uh, but this just goes to say that uh, this vulnerability of us in the European continent uh, also drives us to look into other region and to support other region in uh, their mitigation efforts. Um, yeah, Switzerland, my country, has been, uh, I think, part uh, parcel of this uh, moving this disaster. And launched the so-called Nansen Initiative, and under this Nansen Initiative, adopted in 2015 in G uh, Geneva, more than 100 countries joined it. And I understand that the plat platform on disaster uh, displacement is a follow-up and Switzerland has been supporting this follow-up. I think I'd like to mention three 
uh, parts. One is uh, SPREP, we did a, a secondment, uh, an Anson initiative secondment to conduct regional consultations here. Uh, the second one uh, was the Biennial Pacific Climate Change Roundtable, uh, with the abbreviation PCCR, uh, which we supported, uh, I understand, the first forum in this region to address uh, climate change uh, here. And uh, we also uh, did a 12 month secondment uh, of um, um, platform disaster displacement regional advisor to UNESCO. So I think this just goes to show uh, we support those initiatives. We support those initiatives, I think, uh, not with a hidden agenda, on the contrary. Uh, we would like to support your work and your analysis uh, to address the gaps that you have identified. And I think this project is another example of this approach. We are here in a complementary role, I would say. We will we are happy and proud to be able to support you in the important work you do, uh, in the research briefs you have already uh, prepared. And uh, we're also, of course, keen to see uh, how this uh, develops further. And at this stage, I would just like to thank you for having been able to address you. Um, of course, we're looking very much forward to the discussions now. And thank everybody um, part of this project, uh, the, the PIFS, the SPREP, SPC, IOM, the Tech Working Group, yourself, and um, all other uh, important stakeholders I might have forgotten here. Uh, so over to you and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Grass, uh, for those uh, remarks. Uh, and, uh, and thank you once again uh, to the Swiss uh, Confederation for their generous contribution, which made the development of these research briefs possible. Colleagues, uh, I would like now to Welcome our first uh, speaker for today. Uh, our sp first speaker is uh, Professor uh, Daniel Fitzpatrick. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick uh, will be speaking on considering land tenure and human mobility in the context of climate change. Let me just very quickly give a brief um, uh, background on Professor Fitzpatrick. Uh, he is a professor in law uh, resources at Monash University in Australia, and he's a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars in Washington, D.C. Uh, professor Fitzpatrick uh, writes on property rights uh, in contexts of natural disasters and climate change. He has extensive experience in public policy, uh, of course, on uh, property rights and development, and most of uh, and most recent policy work uh, for World Bank uh, is on land tenure and disaster risk management in situations of fragility, conflict, and violence. Professor Fitzpatrick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Solomon, and thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'll be as quick as I I can. Um, so my research brief, as you heard, is on land tenure and climate mobility. Uh, now, normally when we talk about mobility, as we've heard, it covers displacement, migration and relocation. Uh, but when it comes to land tenure in the Pacific, another way to look at it concerns the location and the scale of the movement. And that's where I've started the research brief. So it's a typology of human mobility as it affects land tenure. Uh, so first we looked at, um, we've got a bunch of case studies, uh, there, there are a bunch of case studies in the research brief, movement within customary territory, um, then movement to other customary territory, or that's customary territory of our other groups, and that includes not only rural areas, but also peri-urban areas, as we know, there's uh, informal settlements are developing outside of the city boundaries on customary land. And we have case studies, there's case studies on that in the brief. And then finally, movement to alienated land. And to put it simply, alienated land is land that is not classified as customary land. Uh, and it's mainly in the cities, um, but there are rural areas of alienated land that are leg legacies of the colonial period. So an analysis of the various case studies that we have, we need more case studies. Uh, but I covered uh, what we have. Um, then also in the brief, I, I looked at uh, a large number of 
policy instruments relating to uh, disaster risk reduction, disaster risk management, climate adaptation. And I was interested to see how much is land tenure. We, all, we often hear about land tenure and how important it is, but how much is it reflected in current policy instruments? And the answer was that it was surprisingly, surprisingly little or surprisingly few references. Uh, and uh, that's set out in the brief. Um, there are references to land use planning and very important, obviously. There's also references to geospatial data, uh, which is a function of land administration. Uh, and I'll have more to say on that later. But when it comes to land tenure and land rights, there's surprisingly few references. Now, that's not a criticism of those policy instruments. I think everyone understands is that the, the next stage and the future stages of policy development need to start linking up uh, to other areas, including land tenure policy. Um, and that's the subject of the, the second half of the brief is, is a set of recommendations. Um, and first I focus on customary land. And so we, we're just looking at small scale movement of, of people. Um, and just picking up on those points from the introductory video, I think they're absolutely critical. You know, first, it's a last resort relocation. Sometimes displacement, it occurs and it's forced and we can't do anything about it. And of course you have migration. Um, but whichever type of mobility we're talking about, we, we, if people have to move and we don't want them to move, but if they have to move, the preference has to be that it's a small scale movement. And it's just so much easier. Um, the second recommendation, again, picks up on the introductory video, the importance of understanding the past, right? And understanding cultural pathways for people to move successfully and effectively in the Pacific. And that's through kinship networks, trading networks, cultural networks, and that needs to be incorporated into policy. The third recommendation, and I know that places such as Fiji are working on this at the moment, is that in the relocation guidelines that are emerging and also the post-disaster needs assessments, there needs to be specific land tenure assessments. So that's a tool to assess land tenure issues early on through resettlement displacement. Um, the fourth one is slightly technical, but um, many countries in the Pacific allow leases over customary land. Uh, some countries don't, don't allow it, right? But those that do allow leases, it can be through a land trust or a land trust board or an incorporated land group. There's various mechanisms, but generally I think the leasing mechanism provides a way to uh, support people who move to other customary land um, and that these leases can be improved considerably with mandatory provisions. Um, and I set those out. And the final recommendation relating to customary land concerns peri-urban settlements. Um, I think the critical issue here is that we need to focus on informal settlements, both peri-urban and urban, because they will be a major pressure point for human mobility. And in terms of land tenure, we need, we need to know who, who's living there and where, right? It's, there, there's informal transactions, there's informal gov governance systems in these settlements, but they're, they're too disassociated from formal systems, particularly in terms of uh, risk reduction planning, right? Climate adaptation planning, risk management planning. And so uh, I describe a set of tools that, that are being rolled out in some areas already, in Port Vila, uh, in Honiara, to just to descriptively record who is living in a, informal settlements and where are they living, right? Um, and then in terms of alienated land, uh, a key recommendation is the importance of a land audit that is to identify public land. We know that a lot of public land is contested in the Pacific and that's made it difficult to demarcate exactly where the boundaries are. The, the important thing is to start off with uncontested public land. Uh, so we know what is where for future cases of displacement where people can move temporarily or permanently and there's an audit in place that so we've already got a system of, of, of land ready to go. Um, the second um, recommendation is similar to the peri-urban settlements. Um, it's a descriptive process. Now, I want to emphasize one important thing here is that land tenure reform is 
politically and culturally sensitive. We all know that. I'm, I'm not suggesting major reform to land law. I'm saying that through the disaster risk reduction, disaster risk management and climate adaptation planning, we can actually make many of these land tenure steps. And that includes recording tenure and transactions in, in informal settlements, because then we know people are displaced. We know where they came from, right? We have a record. We're not saying they have a legal right to that land. We're just saying, well, let's find out who they are. Uh, for adaptation and, and risk management. And then the final point goes back to geospatial data is that, you know, there are moves all around the world, including the Pacific, to link up data platforms, you know, early warning systems, um, geospatial mechanisms to know where buildings are, where water sources are, types of land, forest land, etc. But the missing link here is people, that the geospatial data platforms that are being rolled out need to link up with land tenure because we need to know who is living in these areas in order to have effective risk, risk reduction. Um, so there, and that's it. It's a very important Hopefully it'll encourage you to make. Thank you. Can I ask um, anyone who's had the, the microphone on to please mute? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Fitzpatrick, uh, for those very valuable insights uh, into the findings uh, of the research brief on the importance of land tenure and land rights, and uh, and how they say uh, relocation in the context of climate change in the Pacific. I think it's there are quite a number of very valuable points that you indicated uh, in your brief. Of course, we know that land tenure and land rights is a very uh, sensitive. Uh, issue and as you pointed out, uh, it's both politically and culturally sensitive and a very complex issue. Uh, we know in the Pacific, uh, where especially where it relates to relocation of you know displaced uh, communities uh, due to to climate change related events and and disasters, uh, it's a really good uh, insight uh, and I think it's important for us to be cognizant of those different land tenure structures and and land rights issues and how they impact on sustainable relocation and adaptation initiatives and, and policies. Uh, but of course, the most affected people due to the effects of climate change and disasters are those that are the most uh, vulnerable in the communities. Uh, and I think it's it's timely also to consider, you know, looking at uh, a vulnerability assessment of, of communities and to have more reliable de data on uh, those that are uh, more vulnerable. Uh, in, in this regard, I would like to ask our next uh, next presenter, Dr. Patrick uh, Fong. He will be speaking um, on the research brief findings, uh, which focuses on examining the effects of climate change on women and persons of uh, persons with disability in Fiji, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu, with uh, an emphasis on human mobility. Dr. Fong uh, is a freelance consultant. Uh, he has considerable working experience in the Pacific Island countries, focusing on climate justice, uh, social inclusion, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and Dr. Fong's work uh, also looks at the sustainable development of island communities, mainly working with the international development uh, organizations, together with regional organizations and academic uh, institutions in the region. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fong, um, for joining us. Uh, the floor is now uh, uh, over to you. Uh, Dr. Fong, uh, just checking if you're still with us. Yeah, can we confirm if uh, Dr. Fong is is still um, on the line? Yes, he, he's online. I'm just trying to ask okay. him to unmute. Um, okay. 
Patrick, if you can unmute, please. And also, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Fong, over to you. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, someone. Right. Um. Just trying to share this. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, and uh, apologies, uh, there's been some technical um, issues here on my side. Uh, so basically, now I'm going to present on uh, the second uh, study that uh, we did. And uh, our team was responsible in terms of uh, uh, doing actual uh, on the ground uh, analysis uh, in terms of uh, trying to understand uh, women and visibility or gender and visibility in the context of climate mobility. And uh, our case study was in uh, Fiji, Solomon Islands, and uh, Vanuatu. And uh, the sites that uh, we identified from these uh, three countries were uh, uh, in Fiji, it was uh, the Soa Soa catchment in Lambasa, Bunulebu, and Andrasa um, Avenue that's in Lotoka. And uh, for Solomon Islands, it was uh, uh, Mataniko catchment, that's uh, in the heart of Honiara, and uh, Titinge catchment. And uh, for Vanuatu, it was along the Tagabe River catchment. And they were chosen based on, um, you know, we, ha we have these watershed uh, projects uh, running in these uh, catchments along uh, in these uh, three countries. And uh, when this opportunity came over, uh, this study, we thought of uh, just uh, focus on those uh, areas. And this was during COVID uh, uh, here in Fiji, and uh, there was uh, restrictions in terms of travel. So we tried and maximize uh, you know, our engagement in these areas by incorporating this uh, study. And um, I just want to show the participants uh, some of the photos uh, of what's happening uh, in our region uh, in the last uh, few years. And uh, in this year for Asia, in Fiji, Vanuatu, Solomon, it's been uh, frequent uh, flooding along these catchments. And uh, not only that, for Solomon and Vanuatu, I mean, for Fiji and Vanuatu, there's been uh, hurricanes uh, with uh, high intensity, severity. And uh, for all the three countries, uh, due to ocean acidification, and uh, there's a record of uh, uh, coral bleaching and destruction of uh, reef uh, ecosystem. Eh? And uh, we've uh, passed the studies we've identified you know, how these impacts of climate change are happening and how it's affecting the population. And, um, you know, when we were doing this uh, study, uh, the, the main uh, feedback from participants was that, was that uh, even for us, people that uh, you know, do not have any disability or for men, and, uh, we're already finding it hard. And uh, for people, persons with disabilities, 
and women due to their existing uh, impairment and barriers and challenges uh, through access or through cultural uh, side of things for us in the Pacific, they are finding these impacts, you know, more harder for them. Eh? And uh, in, the, in this study, it was uh, interesting because um, there is um, not much uh, you know, uh, research being done in terms of understanding um, climate change and uh, persons with disabilities, uh, even women, and uh, let alone the aspect of uh, climate mobility. Eh? And so our research objective was first was to review the implications of climate change and mobility, and uh, specifically for women and uh, persons with disabilities, and uh, try and to reflect on lessons learned and best practices in the management of climate-related mobility uh, with those uh, with that uh, uh, component. Uh, we asked the question how women and persons with disability eh, generally have been reflected in climate change policies and uh, also try and identify recommendations and solutions you know, to uh, inform uh, decision makers, policy makers, into how programs and policies can you know, better incorporate uh, the participation of uh, women and uh, persons with disability. And uh, you know, this was the photo from uh, Vanuatu, how, um, you know, oh, Whenever one of the the respondents mentioned that whenever a hurricane uh, strikes, it is the men that usually go out and do the cleaning. But uh, usually it's the women, and they find it, uh, you know, clearing uh, debris is more uh, needs more manpower. But uh, in fact, for women, you know, looking at try and get the household items, cleaning it up when the water is uh, dirty and, uh, you know, it's more, it was interesting because this lady said that, in fact, we are doing a lot of hard work uh, and being a woman, uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, rehab of the shelter. And, um, what we found was that uh, livelihood, uh, health, and uh, economic uh, as part of the uh, you know um, mostly affected uh, for persons with disability and uh, women, and. Um, for livelihood, the majority of them, uh, of the respondents, 89% of the respondents agree that, uh, that climate change you know, in the three countries has affected uh, livelihoods of women and uh, persons with disability. And uh, this was to do with uh, you know, reduction of farm production, uh, increase in drought, and uh, like I've mentioned, the, the impact is similar to women, persons with disability, and men and non-disability you know, individuals. But the issue is that women and persons with disability are having more, you know, uh, experiencing, you know, they, they, they call it, um, it's uh, four or five times uh, fold eh, in terms of uh, the hardship that they face. And uh, according to respondents, you know, those uh, observed changes in uh, the climate have affected uh, crop yields for household and uh, general population. And for uh, Vanuatu and for higher risk as cover and other root crops, it's really affecting uh, uh, people with disability and uh, women. And for health, uh, majority of the respondents, 84%, says that uh, women and persons with disability are increasingly 
increasingly experiencing health uh, problems. And uh, this has to do with uh, waterborne diseases, anxiety after, uh, you know, after a, a disaster or trauma or mental illness. And um, coupled with uh, cultural barriers and the physical impairment that persons with disability have, um, they're finding it more hard uh, or more prone to diseases eh? after a cyclone or after a flooding event. And in terms of uh, mobility, majority of the respondents reported that they have not migrated, uh, while the remaining uh, respondents mentioned that their family had internal migration and basic uh, displacement. And this is basically through you know, going into evacuation centers. And uh, one of the issues that uh, you know, came up from the respondent for persons with disability was uh, access in these uh, facilities yeah? they were not uh, uh, disability friendly yeah? they, and uh, for women these uh, facilities in most times they don't have uh, the proper uh, facilities for women in terms of uh, uh, sanitation yeah? and uh, we did uh, another analysis on the percentage of respondents who are aware of uh, policies uh, in terms of climate change or specific for climate uh, mobility. Uh, and really ask question on, uh, you know, are you aware of any community plans or sub-regional or provincial plans or even national uh, policies that, uh, you know, looks at uh, climate change or even uh, climate mobility. And uh, the majority, as we can see from this uh, figure, you know, they're they are not aware of uh, all these policies and uh, let alone the, their role uh, in terms of being in, you know, embedded in these policies. And uh, for those that uh, are aware, you know, participants of, um, in terms of the development uh, of these policies or plans, also the majority, you know, did not take part at all. And uh, and uh, from this uh, study that uh, we did, uh, we found that climate change observed by respondents, for both women and persons with disability, and. Uh, includes unpredictable uh, rain patterns, more flooding, uh, more severe hurricanes and tropical storms, sea level rise and more coastal erosion. And for women and persons with disability, <coughs> we've concluded that they are severely affected by these changes. And uh, especially like uh, I've mentioned in this uh, area of uh, livelihood, food security, income, uh, and health, and uh, the impacts of climate change on this area you know, will increase women and uh, persons with disabilities, vulnerabilities, and their social, cultural, attitudinal, communication, physical, uh, these barriers yeah, that they face um, in their societies. And uh, while the three countries are, you know, in the climate change hotspots, Really, the primary reason for migration, you know, really the primary reason for migration is uh, climate change, and uh, livelihood and eco economic causes were given as their primary reasons for migration. Eh? Uh, in terms of uh, the three countries, currently have, you know, they all have national policies to address climate change. Or for Fiji and Vanuatu, they have specific. Uh, policies for climate mobility and um, they have uh, incorporated uh, components in terms of uh, women and uh, persons with disability but interestingly you know, you know most of these uh, respondents uh, were not aware of these uh, policies or even plans let alone you know their participation in the development uh, initial development of these uh, plans and uh, as a way forward, uh, 
what uh, we've come up based on uh, this study is uh, firstly to develop specific guidance to ensure the participation of women and persons with disability in their respective organizations or uh, whether it's uh, community-based organizations or you know organizations that represent them in climate change related actions and this is maybe and um, to better understand the experiences of women and persons with disability, there needs to be more studies that target person and uh, persons with disability who have migrated. Like uh, I've mentioned uh, earlier on, this uh, study was based on an existing project that uh, we run in this uh, catchment. And uh, when uh, we did it, we just focused on persons with disability and women, eh? and uh, but with the aim of this uh, study to focus on climate mobility, it'll be really good to try and identify a sample of those that have really been really you know, internally, internally or externally displaced or migrated. Eh? And, uh, and when we do that, we will have a better understanding of um, the issues that women and uh, persons with disability face in terms of uh, climate uh, mobility. And uh, studies are also recommended to assess uh, how multiple mobility drivers, uh, including uh, economic uh, um, and you know, how they interact uh, with uh, climate change and one another, that leads to women and persons with disability being uh, relocated whether it's a temporary or permanent basis. Eh? And uh, communities and uh, sub-regional or province and national stakeholders should provide tailor-made uh, climate change adaptation strategies for women and uh, persons with disability. As uh, you're aware, in uh, most of our Pacific Island countries, uh, when we talk about adaptation, it's a blanket uh, strategy, uh, but we should uh, realize that women and persons with disability have special needs and uh, they have uh, uh, um, barriers within uh, societies that these uh, adaptation strategies might not work for them. Eh? And uh, more awareness about uh, policies and planning is needed for these two groups. Um, Apologies, Doctor. Yes. Can you can you wrap up in the next minute, please? Thank you. Hello, Shalom. Sorry, Doctor Fong. Can you wrap up in the next minute? Thank you. Okay. And uh, development of future climate change policies need to be inclusive and ensure that women and persons with disability are not only included in terms of uh, the wording, but to actively participate eh, in the development of these policies. Um, and lastly, experts at many levels need to engage in advocacy and networking in regards to how persons with disability and women can be uh, recognized and fully incorporated into climate change mobility work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fong, uh, for highlighting the impacts of climate change on, on women and persons with disability in the context of um, mobility uh, in the Pacific and especially covering those three countries, uh, Solomon Islands, uh, Fiji and, and Vanuatu. Uh, it's interesting to see some of the findings uh, of your research uh, brief uh, on some of the issues around uh, in inclusion of women and persons with disability uh, in policies related to, to climate change. Uh, we will now move on to our final presentation, uh, which will be from Dr. Fanny uh, Thornton. Uh, Dr. Thornton's presentation uh, will cover issues of financial resources in support of planned uh, relocation and other types of climate change related mobility uh, in the Pacific. Uh, so before we uh, go to our question and answer session, we have a recorded uh, video presentation from Dr. Thornton, who is not able to join us uh, in person. Uh, and uh, let me just give a very uh, quick um, a background on Dr. Thornton. Uh, Dr. Thornton is an adjunct uh, associate uh, professor in law at the University of Canberra. 
in Australia. She is also the project lead of the Climate Adaptation Research Study at Germany's uh, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Dr. Thornton has extensive experience in public international law, refugee law, migration, climate adaptation, and human rights. Uh, please join me in listening to the recorded presentation by Dr. Thornton. Hi, my name is Fanny Thornton. Um, I am affiliated with both the University of Canberra and the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in Germany. I'm really sorry that I was unable to join your important meeting today, but I thought I would provide you at least with a recording. So thank you for your time in listening to what I have to say. So I was one of the people that had been asked to prepare one of the research briefs for the technical working group on human mobility. And the topic that I covered was basically how you finance uh, planned relocation and other types of human mobility in the Pacific region. And I'm going to report to you at least briefly today on some of the things I looked at and the key findings and recommendations that can also be found in my report. Okay, so um, I'll give you a little bit of background today in particular on what uh, financing needs and costs there might arise in connection with climate related mobility in the Pacific. I'll talk quite a bit about uh, financing sources that I looked at that was really the biggest chapter that I wrote for my report. I'm going to say a few things about principles that might need to guide financing at all kinds of levels, talk briefly about financing uh, governance and then share with you some of my key recommendations as noted. Okay, so what are the needs and costs that arise in relation to climate mobility? I think a lot of this has to do with the type of climate event that one looks at. So for example, if mobility is driven by a rapid onset, uh, onset event, then likely the costs relate both to prevention, so wanting to prevent that mobility happening in the first place, as well as helping out and providing disaster relief largely where that event has happened and mobility with that. There are, of course, also slow onset events that can lead to climate related mobility. So for reasons um, of drought, um, for example, and here the costs arise also in relation to prevention, perhaps putting in place adaptation measures in such a way that mobility is diminished, if not prevented. Um, but also largely here uh, costs arise in relation to planning for an implementing uh, relocation, which could be quite close by or which could be further far. In my report, I talk a little bit also about costs that might arise in relation to immobility. So this is the people that are staying put. This can be voluntarily or involuntarily. Involuntarily, we're talking often about uh, trapped populations. So there might be some costs there as well. So not just related to people moving, but also those that uh, uh, cannot or do not want to. My report talks a fair bit also about the different uh, difference between uh, financing tangible needs and intangible needs. Um, so far, where there has been climate mobility finance in the region, a lot of the focus has been on financing tangible needs that arise or costs that arise. But in the research that I did for my project, there was quite a bit of mention also um, by research participants that intangible needs, for example, related um, um, to mental health or, cu or culture might also need some more consideration um, when it comes to financing mobility. In terms of actual costings um, related to climate mobility, there's a little bit of precedent in the region, in particular in Fiji. There have been some detailed costings uh, that have been published and that are not difficult to find. Um, either uh, in terms of what the costs are uh, that are related to the relocation in particular um, of, of, of individual communities. Okay, so sources uh, of funding for climate mobility is a lot of what I looked at in my report and I divided it there into international sources, regional sources and domestic slash bilateral sources. Now, to just say a few very general things about this, the finance architecture that may be relevant to climate mobility is convoluted, fractured, and frequently difficult to access, uh, unfortunately. 
um, whatever funding there is or that seems relevance, uh, relevant, the actual relevant relevance of a lot of funding to climate mobility is negligible, at least for now. Funding for mobility prevention or post-disaster relief is more prevalent, so there are sources and some of them are long established. Funding for plant mobility for the time being remain, remains fairly scarce. In terms of international sources, I looked at mobility in the context of adaptation. So there are lots of channels there that one could possibly think about. I think what's getting increasingly important in terms of signaling one's funding needs is that uh, individual countries have a NAP, um, National Adaptation Plan. So I do understand that there's uh, you know, a lot of issue or maybe not a lot of faith necessarily in those and getting the activities that countries put in those funded. Nevertheless, it is an important signal to, uh, to signal at least what you need and perhaps gain some funding. Um, that said, the NAPs that are out there from the region and beyond, um, where they talk about mobility, they talk about mobility prevention. So things like warning systems, the seawall approach to keep, you know, the rising waters at bay, um, etc. So maybe one of the questions then is, is it time to approach um, um, a, an adaptation fund, uh, for example, for assistance also with relocation, so actual mobility and not just its prevention. Mobility arises internationally also in the context of uh, loss and damage, of course, displacement in particular as a mobility type sits in this framework. Uh, that's a very nice connection to exist uh, climate mobility within loss and damage. The problem, though, is that loss and damage is a kind of a, um, an area um, of climate change and the climate change negotiations where there is few channels of funding that have actually developed or that are attached to it. So here, then, um, it may be the approach, the best approach may be to uh, keep working on developing uh, loss and damage as also an area um, where funding can be sourced. Finally, internationally speaking, there is, of course, humanitarian and disaster funding, and those are the channels that have indeed existed um, for some time. Now, they have notoriously been responsive in a reactive kind of way, but that's slowly shifting to more proactive planning, um, also in the context um, of mobility. And one thing that my research stumbled upon here is, for example, the Pacific Response to, disa uh, to Disaster Development Project, which is about proactive data collection, mapping, risk modeling, policy development, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this could really be dis, uh, expanded in the humanitarian and disaster response space also with some benefit for mobility. Okay, regional sources. There are some regional sources that are also um, relevant. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind here is disaster risk finance. Some of that has existed for a long time as well. Examples of that are sovereign catastrophe risk insurance, micro insurance schemes, et cetera, et cetera. They exist in many regions of the world, including uh, some in the Pacific Island region. They often come with uh, multilateral development bank support, but they also come in after the fact again. So there's nothing proactive about it. So setting yourself up uh, for disaster related events, uh, it's going in after a disaster has happened and kind of uh, blunting the impact of that, I guess. Now, what's kind of new um, on the scene in terms of regional sources of funding that could be relevant is the Pacific Resilience Facility. What's really promising about it uh, in looking at it is that it that funding with this facility should be easier to access. There's also a certain element of pre predictability to the funding that it will disperse. It uh, is funding that is to be attached to small scale community level resilience building, which does of course have something to do um, with climate mobility and its uh, prevention, um, I guess. And it also prioritizes prioritizes vulnerable populations, many of which are the ones also vulnerable to uh, mobility pressures that arise uh, from climate change. Now, that's all, uh, th those are the promising features of the facility. However, when it comes to mobility uh, uh, specifically, it is not actually mentioned in any of the documents uh, pertaining to the Pacific Resilience Facility that I researched. Um, 
it's also is exclusively about financing activities that might enable communities to stay. So we're talking again about that seawall um, approach, but relocations, for example, so planning proactively um, to move people as a kind of an adaptation response is not uh, mentioned. And in any case, the fund is also too small for a whole community to exclusively rely on for its relocation, for example. Um, of course, it's also a fund that's up and coming. It yet needs to be operationalized and also seeded. So, uh, so it's a kind of a watch this space um, area. Then there are uh, sources of funding in the climate mobility context that are domestic or bilateral that are worth touching on or worth considering. They're promising in the sense that they might fill the gap left by focusing a lot on post-disaster finance. So they may be the kind of funding channels that aid you in your planned relocation and your uh, in your planned um, mobility. There is a little bit of formal precedent uh, about this that has emerged in recent years in Fiji, but also in Bangladesh over a larger time frame. Already the resourcing when it comes to a kind of domestic fund for climate mobility might be bilateral uh, bilateral development assistance, taxes um, or levies. So things that you bring in uh, externally or that you somehow source um, within your tax system, for example. Now, the important thing here from, from having talked to people about this, especially about that latter option of, for example, uh, implementing taxes or levies or something within your own um, um, finance or economic system, uh, the key here is that you try and implement something that is the least burden on your own population. Now, some of the relevant taxes and levies that exist in the region are tied to the um, tourism sector or entertainment sector. So in many ways, target um, foreign visitors um, to countries. Of course, there have been significant reductions of such visitors in recent years due to the impact of the COVID um pandemic so these sources of funding haven't proven particularly uh, uh, fruitful in recent years and perhaps uh, alternatives need to be found but my point here is merely that they don't burden um, local populations also from a point of view of climate justice um you know where does the source of climate change uh, lay and then and and where where do its cons consequences get experienced there's a little bit of, um, finally, a little bit of um, evidence that there's also community initiative that's part of uh, sourcing funding for community relocations um, in the region. Uh, my, my report details a couple of examples of that, of that. Of course, this will never be, I guess, the exclusive source of funding, uh, but it is making a contribution uh, where relocation in particular is concerned. Now, I don't want to speak, speak at great length here about principal action um, on this, but I merely want to say here that I think where sourcing and awarding mobility finance is concerned, a kind of principal approach is really important because uh, uh, mobility finance operates in a system of scarcity and therefore, it's really important that some principles underpin its sourcing and distribution, um, in particular, how you determine, you know, who, who gets money, gets finance in um, a system of scarcity. How do you determine eligibility? Uh, some of what I talk about in terms of principles also has to do with um, um, uh, sort of communication about funding, participation, and things like that. Now, there's already some fine principles enshrined in the emerging regional climate relocation and displacement policies, and I think some of what's contained there could also serve as guidance for developing a principled approach uh, uh, in terms of climate mobility finance more um, specifically. But again, I have a, a section on this in my report and, uh, and my recommendations also detail a number of specific um, points. I wanted to say a few things briefly about governance. Again, I have a, a larger section on this in my report. 
but generally what I have talked about here today and what my um, report talks about is that funding is scarce and hence relevant governance structures so far concerning climate mobility finance are also um, scarce. At the international and regional level, you might have some mobility platforms with strong governance structures, but they're not dedicated to finance. And um, you might equally have climate finance platforms with strong governance structures, but they're not dedicated to mobility. Yeah. In the domestic context, I think we have only got some initiatives that are really um, starting in a few countries in the region. So to be honest, there is um, little precedent so far to talk about governance structures, but I would say that it's really vital in whatever does emerge um, that independent oversight is um, strong, also following that principled approach that I noted um, briefly earlier in terms of really um, getting it right, how money is dispersed, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then it's definitely notable, although we have, these budding levels um, of governance that are, have some relevance to climate mobility and climate mobility finance, there's very few links um, between existing structures and maybe that's one of my core recommendations uh, is to try and strengthen um, the links between, between structures that exist and that are emerging. Okay, and so then my report indeed ended up with a bunch of recommendations. I don't think we the scope of this presentation is today to um, go through all of them, but I will say a few things in terms of recommendations related to needs and costs and also to sourcing mobility finance. These recommendations really stem from what I have already been talking about in my presentation. So in terms of sourcing money um, and, and uh, arriving um, at, at finance, what does it need to cover? Um, well, it might have to cover the mobile as well as the immobile. It's very important that uh, climate mobility finance is not just in, uh, available in the post-disaster mobility context, but also in the planned mobility context where at all possible. Uh, it needs to, funding needs to be available for all stages of mobility, the planning stage, the kind of during stage and the aftermath um, stage. And then finally, at this point I made earlier already, um, there might have to be a strong consideration for funding, not only um, related to tangible um, needs or costs, but also those that are intangible health and culture related came up in particular. Sourcing mobility finance, what would be my recommendations? Well, uh, despite all its flaws, I think it's important that all regional nation states submit a map to express uh, also in part what needs they might have in relation to climate mobility. It may be time that in some shape or form, um, funding and uh, um, application under an international finance mechanism concerning climate mobility is initiated and I mean beyond uh, uh, mobility prevention, I mean to actually facilitate um, a mobility process. Um, there need to be continuing efforts regionally speaking to secure funding channels for loss and damage. I know this is ongoing work and the most recent um, COP wasn't, in, uh, wasn't particularly promising in that regard um, again, but I think these efforts need to continue. The regional funding arrangements that are emerging, um, it would be good if um, there too the money that is available is not just for mobility prevention, so adaptation that keeps people in place, as important um, as that is, but that there may also be funding options to actually support people uh, moving from one place to another. Um, when it comes to bilateral support, so kind of filling just the domestic um, coffers with some finance um, related to climate mobility, where that comes via bilateral support, really making sure that sources are approached uh, that have a high degree of likelihood of being funded. So in my conversations with stakeholders uh, for this research, it was noted, you know, that bilateral funding organizations, they would be more keen to fund certain aspects um, of a mobility project over others. For example, the planning stages or some of the aftermath stages um, rather than maybe the in-between 
my report highlights um, the things uh, that were passed on to me in some greater detail. Um, it's really important that where domestic sources are set up to facilitate climate mobility, that they do not burden um, domestic populations. I don't think that, any, that any, anybody really has that intention necessarily. However, the, the sources that have existed have tended to go for external visitors, which have been much more scarce in, re in recent years. And then, yeah, it's really important um, to also get uh, community support, com community buy-in, um, and not least also um, in terms of getting the community actually involved in um, uh, sourcing some of the funding that might be involved in a mobility project in the region as well. Being mindful there perhaps also of climate justice principles in a couple of conversations I had with stakeholders, the community contributions came from things like, um, I don't know, logging timber. So, you know, we're talking about a climate uh, change related issue here and then um, um, cutting down, I guess, a carbon uh, a capture source is maybe perhaps not the way to go to help in financing um, a mobility project. I have recommendations related to principles and governance, but I don't think I want to talk about them um, in great detail today. They are detailed again in my report, which I'm sure is or will be um, distributed for further perusal. And that's all I have to say. Um, I'm sorry I'm unable to take questions or comments in person, but you are very, very welcome to get in touch with me at any point, both at my uni Canberra email or my email at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Thank you so much for your attention and I wish you all the best for your further um, discussions and further presentations today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thornton, for highlighting the findings from the research brief on financing relocation and activities connected to climate-related mobility in the Pacific. Uh, we will, of course, uh, take note of any questions and comments uh, for Dr. Thornton, uh, and uh, we can also forward to her uh, any questions or comments you may have. Uh, we have now heard from our three speakers uh, three on the three research briefs addressing the important topics uh, of financing relocation uh, and other climate-related uh, mobility activities in the Pacific. Uh, let me once again thank the three uh, presenters for these very uh, interesting findings, um, including uh, recommendations as well. Uh, the importance of land tenure and land rights, of course, uh, really important in the context of climate change. Uh, and in integrating the perspectives of women and people with disabilities on mobility um, on national policies is also um, an important um, um, element when it comes to discussing uh, climate change uh, related issues. I would like to open the floor now for any questions and, uh, and comments. Uh, please uh, feel free to share with us your views uh, on these three topics. Um, let me uh, firstly apologize that we have gone beyond the hour uh, and uh, if you're able to, uh, to stay with us, we'll be able to finish in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so thank you once again to everyone who are able to uh, stay with us. Uh, the floor is now open for any questions or, or comments related to the first uh, two research briefs. Feel free to, to raise your hand or unmute and, and ask any questions.
Any questions uh, or comments? Uh, once again, if you have any specific questions for Dr. Thornton, feel free to put them in the chat uh, or send them to the context that um, she provided. Hi, Solomon. There's one question there from Charlie Ringby. Thank you. The chat. So the question is, um, Solomon Islands, like many of our Pacific Islands, is currently experiencing a number of climate refugees lately. How can we go about sourcing funding for Atoll Islanders? I think this would be a question uh, for Dr. Thornton. Uh, I believe, but uh, if there's anyone um, who wish to um, jump in to, to answer that, please feel free as well. There's another question from Shivani. Prof. Um, Fitzpatrick mentioned during his session that the concept of land leases in some Pacific Islands could assist in the mobility related concerns. I hope I understood this correctly. If the professor could briefly elaborate on how this would work. Uh, professor Thornton, do you, uh, sorry, Professor Fitzpatrick, do you wish to uh, answer this? Over to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Shivani. So um, generally with, with customary land uh, in the Pacific, uh, you're, not, you're not able to sell it. Right, which is a good thing. Um, but a number of jurisdictions allow people to lease customary land uh, from the customary landowners or either directly or indirectly. Um, and that has been used as a mechanism to manage mobility in the past. So we have examples where uh, a customary group has been displaced um, uh, onto the land of another customary group and they've entered into a, a, an agreement uh, to have the land and it's, it's in the form of a, a lease or something like a lease. Or you have other examples where you, you, you could get a lease from the, a land trust board um, or a land trust uh, and that can be arranged, uh, you know, through government processes. And that is a mechanism. If people have been forced to move to the customary land of another group, uh, or they've been relocated or displaced, and perhaps even if they've migrated, um, then one mechanism for them for, to get tenure security is to enter into a lease with the customary landowners or the land trust board that manages the customary land. Now, so there are existing mechanisms in the Pacific to lease customary land. And what I'm saying is that these can be strengthened to support human mobility. So if a group uh, has to live and stay on customary land of another group, then you have a standard form lease or a lease that must have mandatory provisions. And that's things like, well, what happens if the population grows and, you know, and they want to access bush gardens outside the boundaries of the lease? Or what happens where at the end of the lease? Um, can we review it, uh, renew it? Or what happens if with a rent, you know, and you want to increase it? Or if there's a dispute? And so you, you have provisions in the lease agreements that support people who have been forced to move by climate change, not to move to the city and not to move to informal settlements, but to enter into an agreement, a, a more sustainable agreement with customary landowners. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick.
I think there's a comment uh, for you, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick. Uh, thanks, Nancy. Yeah, I'll, I will um, email you, but that's exactly the type of situation we're talking about, is that there are existing customary land trusts and uh, forms of leases over customary land that are already there. And, and I'm just saying we can strengthen them, we can improve them to support climate mobility. Uh, so thanks, Nancy. I'll, 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 I will email you. Okay, thank you everyone. If if doesn't... hello. Ulvanaka everyone. This yes, is go ahead. Mr. Kelly. Uh from the Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network here in Silver Fiji. And the question that I would like to pose to the panelists and also like to those who are online is um you know this customary land issues or having access to land, particularly I'm a futuristic um, looking and I'm saying this looking into the future where there will be um, same sex families, same sex couples in the Pacific. And we know that in the Pacific, most of the land is uh, patrilineal, like it's owned by men. So my interest is in like for lesbian couples. Uh, the current practice is uh, in in villages like here in Fiji or the tribal land. Like once the woman is married to a man, they sort of lose some of the access to that land or they lose the powers. And sometimes when they become widowed, it's hard for them to return to their villages and build on their villages uh, because of you know, the patriarchal uh, ways of doing things in the Pacific. So I would expect this to be exacerbated when it comes to climate change, the effect of climate change, uh, and having also uh, these new um, forms of families uh, in the future. So this is a sensitive topic and sensitive issue in the Pacific, but I think this are key things that we would like to bring to the fore in discussions, particularly related to climate change induced uh, migration. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. Uh, anyone uh, from the, um, uh, the panel or um, those joining us wish to, to comment or answer, please feel free to go ahead. I think that's uh, that's an important issue as well, particularly uh, because it covers issues around you know cultural sensitivities, uh, which we have um, discussed and uh, highlighted as well in in some of the briefs. Uh, you know, issues not only bordering around um, some of the cultural norms, but uh, I, I think some of those issues will um, will eventually come out as. Um, as we experience, you know, those issues of uh, uh, displacement and, and movement and looking at the vulnerable groups uh, in society, apart from women and persons with disability, of course, um, you know, the LGBTI community as well can be one of those uh, vulnerable groups in the community as well when it comes to uh, access to resources and support and, and services as well. So I think it's an important point um, for us to take note as well as we look at uh, some of those issues around um, communities and uh, vulnerability of uh, the different groups within the community. Thank you, everyone. I think we are, we are running short um, in our time. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, being with us um, in, uh, in this um, uh, couple of minutes uh, before we conclude uh, our session. Uh, let me just uh, once again, thank you for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, this has been extremely valuable for, for us, especially 
um, to learn the, the findings of the research briefs uh, that was commissioned uh, and uh, of course guided by the PRP uh, Technical Working Group on Human Mobility uh, with the aim to you know, create greater awareness and understanding of climate uh, finance, uh, for planned relocation, the challenges in managing land tenure in the Pacific region, uh, and also experiences of women uh, and people with disability in the context of climate change and related um, mobility. Um, as next steps, we, we welcome your feedback uh, on the research briefs uh, and also any opportunities to, to showcase this to a wider uh, audience. As the technical working group, we also plan to showcase those research briefs uh, at some of the upcoming uh, global and regional events that will be happening soon, uh, such as at the Asia Pacific Ministerial Meeting on Disaster Risk Reduction uh, in September, which will be taking place in Australia, as, a, as well as through regional meetings that will be held in other forums uh, in the Pacific. We hope uh, also uh, to be looking at, you know, how to turn those research briefs into tools and, and checklists for program implementers, policymakers to easily apply uh, some of those recommendations. And should you be interested in uh, the progress of this, please uh, do not hesitate to reach out to us and also to join our technical working group on uh, human mobility, which uh, is a growing space for practitioners, policymakers, and and those who are passionate about the progress um, uh, in work to find, you know, more common Pacific approaches to addressing uh, the issues of climate-related uh, mobility. Once again, Vinaka uh, Wakalevu to all of you, uh, to the presenters, uh, and uh, bye for now. Thank you.